Good morning. My name is Mike McGrath, and I am the Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court. And I'd like to take an opportunity before we begin to. Uh, First of all, thank you all for attending. This is the second argument that we've had in person uh, since COVID crisis began. And uh, so we're probably about as excited as uh, council, maybe not, but we're not as nervous. Uh, I can assure you of that. We don't really care. Uh, let me take an opportunity to introduce members of the court for those of you that don't know. On the far end on this side, we have our senior justice, Jim Rice. Uh, then we have our junior justice, Jim Shea. And then we have Lori McKinnon and Justice Lori McKinnon. And then on the other end, it's Justice Beth Baker, Justice Dirk Sandifer, and Justice Ingrid Gustafson. Speaking for the whole court, we're glad to be here. Um, I want to thank the students and the law school and the university uh, for putting this together. And now is the time set for the argument in LB versus United States. Our counsel ready to proceed? You are. Okay, we will proceed first up. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is April Yupi Roll, and I'm honored to be here on behalf of Amiki supporting LB. Uh, I will speak for 10 minutes and then turn over the rest of the time to Mr. Bechtold. I want to begin by acknowledging that the facts of this case are shocking. But what's even more shocking than that is that the facts of LB's assault are actually not that unique in Indian country. As detailed in the brief filed on behalf of two Montana tribes and two native-led nonprofits, native women suffer the highest rates of violence in the United States. And over half of native women report having been victims of sexual violence. In Montana, the circumstances are just as dire. Native women uh, suffer sexual assault at a rate two times higher than our non-Indian peers. We are four times as likely to go missing. In 2019, 33% of this state's active missing persons cases were made up of Native women. And I wanna provide the court some context for that stat. Um, the, in 2019, Native people in Montana, not just Native women, made up a total of 6.6% .6 of the Montana population. Yet Native women, just like me, made up 33% of our state's missing persons. And against that context, Your Honors, it is vitally important that Native women on our home reservations be able to trust the law enforcement officers who are sworn to protect us. And that's particularly important here where the United States has for over 200 years self-assumed a duty of protection over Indian tribes and has confirmed its pre, uh, preeminent role in uh, public safety in Indian country. Let me ask you a question about that, Council. Yes, sir. Um, your argument and, and the amicus arguments do address the particular facts in this case involving a Native American victim. Uh, what what particular effect does does race uh, play into the court's analysis of the scope of duty? Uh, or, or the employment analysis that we have to do in order to determine whether there's liability here? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, 
As an initial matter, uh, the classification that we're dealing with here is not a racial classification, but a political one. We're talking about tribal sovereignty, tribes as governments, and uh, Native women like myself as citizens of those tribal governments. And uh, I suppose in answer to your question, I would first draw us back to uh, the, the court's consideration of a certified question in general, which is an application of the law to the facts of the case. And the facts here are that we're dealing with a native woman on a reservation serviced by federal law enforcement. And the reason that that matters to your analysis here is because the United States has assumed a specific duty to, uh, in the words of Congress, safeguard the lives of native women. So that's why uh, the uh, amici are here to provide the specific context of native women on reservations. Could potentially the result be different depending upon the race of the victim? Um, your Honor, I don't believe so. I, certainly under the framing of the certified question, no. And quite honestly, the situation on the ground now and the result that the United States is advocating for, that is the disparate result, right? That's the gap. Uh, in my mind, a modest request that Amiki are before this court asking you to resolve. Thank you. So I wanna provide the court some additional context for this duty that I told you the United States has assumed over public safety in Indian country. Um, the relationship between tribes in the United States uh, is commonly referred to as the federal trust responsibility. But what that really is, is a modern name for something called the duty of protection. The United States as a superior sovereign took a more junior sovereign, uh, in this case, the Cheyenne nation, um, under their protection. They first memorialized that obligation in 1825 in article two of their first treaty with the Cheyennes. And over the last 200 years since that treaty was signed, the United States has expanded its role in policing in Indian country and has made specific commitments to safeguard the lives of Native women. In 1885, the United States Congress passed the Major Crimes Act and asserted federal criminal jurisdiction over Indian defendants committing crimes on Indian reservations, which was per, uh, previously reserved to tribes alone. In 1978, the United States Supreme Court decided that our status as tribes and the overriding sovereignty of the federal government meant that tribes no longer had authority to prosecute non-Indian defendants in tribal court. And finally, in 2005, the United States Congress passed a reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And in passing that legislation, the United States Congress recognized not only that it had a duty to safeguard the lives of Native women, but that the United States has in general incurred significant legal and moral obligations to provide for public safety in Indian country. So, so counsel, your, your position then is that this case is limited to the duty that you just described with respect to the Native Americans. Is that, is that correct? Uh, Your Honor, respectfully, no. Uh, I think that the best way to highlight uh, where I think this duty fits in is by comparison to Paul v. Park County. Um, my understanding of the briefs is that the United States and its supporting amici uh, have argued that this case is dissimilar from Paul v. Park County uh, because there was no special duty owed there. And uh, why that matters here is because if the FTCA were not a barrier to the application of the non-delegable duty doctrine, it is our position that LB would absolutely be able to recover from the United States because of the duty owed. So uh, again, the certified question is very broad. But the court's consideration of that question is, you know, tied to the facts of this case. And these are the facts um, in which LB's assault occurred. But the special duty owed is because of the, the Native American heritage of the victim. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. The duty owed is because of LB's Native status. Yes. Okay. So um, wasn't Paul really a case of a contract, state contracting away? liability? Yes, Your Honor. Um, but to make the comparison here, um, the Officer Bullcoming was a BIA law enforcement officer. So we're not talking about the federal government enforcing its own law in Indian country. We're talking about the federal government taking the place of a local tribal police force. And let's think about that for a minute. The federal government hires Dana Bullcoming, who at his sentencing said that he was abusing drugs and alcohol at the time, and they vest him with this sovereign commitment that they have made to protect Native women. So they send him out unsupervised on a remote reservation in Montana, and they're doing that in place of a local tribal law enforcement agency. So in that way, it is sort of similar to the facts of Paul and the use of a contractor. 
The, again, I, I just want to return to where I started. The facts of this case are shocking, and you really don't have to take my word for it. Well, counsel, excuse me. The, yes. The facts are clearly shocking. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. And the federal government's duty here, however it is characterized or sourced, is clear. That's really not the issue in the case, though. The issue in the case is the federal government's liability for criminal conduct of an employee. Mm -hmm. So the, the focus on the, the, the social and public public policy problem, though cannot be ignored, is not really where the focus of this case is at. So I, what I don't understand with the focus on the public policy problem here is how then that comes to bear or should come to bear in your view in the doctrinal application that we have to make here of the Montana tort law. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I would point you back to the disparity, to the fact that if the FTCA were not a barrier here, that this would certain, certainly be a situation under these facts with this duty where the non-delegable duty doctrine would apply. The Ninth Circuit identified that uh, that sort of gap in Montana law disproportionately impacts Native women, and that is sort of how that relates to the question of Montana tort law. And, you know, as to sort of uh, how the doctrines fit together and how to resolve that, I certainly defer to Mr. Bechtold who will address those questions. Um, I see that I have very little time left and I just, um, I want to leave you with uh, not merely my assessment of the facts of this case, but some statements made by the United States at Officer Bull Cummings sentencing. At sentencing, the United States acknowledged that the seriousness of the conduct could not be overstated and that citizens keep these incidents in the back of their minds for their next interaction with law enforcement. They acknowledged that LB herself was uniquely impacted and that the ramifications to her of his sexual assault are likely everlasting. But despite their duty, they turn around and they tell this court that she must rely only on the remedy of a default judgment against a judgment-proof convicted felon. And I uh, submit to you that against the duty owed by the United States here, that result is simply unconscionable. On behalf of Amiki, we urge this court to uh, answer the certified question in the affirmative. We implore you to please close the gap and protect Native women in Montana and afford them the same remedy that would be available to their peers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice and members of the court, I'm Tim Beckel on behalf of LB. And I'd like to thank the University for the University of Montana Law School for hosting us here today and uh, welcome the students and members of the audience here, here and the members of the public here today as well. And I'd like to uh, thank LB who is watching us today uh, to monitor how things are proceeding in her case. Uh, Justices, the Ninth Circuit has presented us with a question for a situation that arrives in a somewhat strange procedural posture. Uh, a question of state law will determine what happens to a federal actor under federal law. In light of the special circumstances of this hearing, and uh, given that you've provided us with some extra time, I assume that, uh, that I suspect rather that you've asked uh, Ask, ask us to give us a little bit more time to explain the case for the audience. So I'll, uh, I beg your indulgence as I take a couple minutes uh, to provide background that uh, probably will be uh, very much uh, repeating for you. But uh, the baseline uh, that we're starting with is, is what we call sovereign immunity. And basically the, the federal government is not liable for anything unless it decides it's liable for it. And so the federal law the federal government has passed a law called the Federal Tort Claim Acts that, uh, that allows for people to sue the government when they've done something wrong, except for those situations where there's an intentional tort like assault or battery or something like that called the intentional tort exception, where they say that for law enforcement only, for law enforcement who, who do assault someone, there is an option to have the federal government liable but only when it happens during the course and scope of that federal officer's employment. 
And so this is where the, the juxtaposition of state law comes that will determine what happens to the federal law when it applies here. So under the Federal Tort Claim Act, the, the question is whether an intentional tort happens is determined by the law of the state, and here that's the law of Montana. So that's where obviously this court comes in. So to determine if this sexual assault that Officer Bullcoming did on LB happened during the course and scope of his employment as a BIA officer, we looked to Montana law on sexual assault in scope and course of employment. And then the federal government will be liable as long as the sexual assault is found to be within the course and scope of the office employment. And so uh, again, for the benefit of the, of the members of the audience, I'll do a little background on the, the law regarding uh, sexual assault in course and scope of employment in Montana law. In 1992, this court decided a case called McGuire, where an orderly in the state-owned Montana Development Center raped a mentally disabled patient. In that case, it went to the district court, and the district court applied a restatement section 214 called the non-delegable duty exception, which holds that employers liable for the actions of its employees when that employer is responsible to protect the others from harm. The district court held that the state was liable for the actions of the employee, the orderly and that the state should be liable. But when that case came to this court, the, this court said, well, we haven't adopted section 214 yet, that non-delegable duty ex exception. So we're gonna leave that to the legislature. And this court said, therefore, the rape was not in the course and scope of employment and that the orderly's employer, the state was not liable. In dissent, however, a, a justice of this court stated that the ruling not to adopt section 214 was holding the interests of the state ahead of the interests of the people of the state and suggested that the, this court should adopt section 214. Now, uh, restatements of law are comp compilations of common law and this court has adopted dozens, if not hundreds of them and incorporated them into Montana law. So it would not be unusual for a court to incorporate uh, sections of, of restatements. Then, in two thousand, let me interrupt you, Mr. Bechtel, because I think that's kind of where the crux of this case is at. Is that, as you point out, McGuire was a case that involved conduct that was, by all accounts, outside the course and scope of the employee's employment, and therefore did not fall within the. Uh, scope of liability under the general rule of respondeat superior. And then the, the problematic point of McGuire, I think, for your case is that then this court did not go on to apply a non delegable duty theory of vicarious liability outside the course and scope of employment. Now, I don't know that I agree with McGuire about that point, but the certified question is limited in scope, it seems, to uh, because of the parameters of the Federal Tort Claim Act to what to federal liability under state tort law within the course and scope of employment. So to the extent that you're asking us to apply something that it is or tantamount to a non delegable duty theory of liability that applies would apply outside the course and scope of employment. How can we do that within the framework of the certified question that's presented to us? Thank you, Justice Sanifer. I am actually not asking the court to uh, apply uh, Section 214 to this case. What I'm asking the court to do is to rule that when an officer uses the power of his, his the the, the power of his position, that is the authority given to him as a law enforcement officer to sexually assault someone, that that is within the course and scope of his employment, precisely because of that power imbalance between a police officer and a member of the public. So it's certainly not in his job description to, to you know, go in and rape someone. And it certainly wasn't the job description of the driver in Paul to swerve around and and try to make the inmates spill urine on themselves, but he did it. He used the power of his position as a driver of that van to do it. Similarly here, Officer Bullcoming used the power of his position 
used the authority given to him by the BIA to exert that power. And it was only because he was in, a, in uniform on duty that he had the power to do so. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. Right. Well, counsel, can you speak to the fact, I mean, in McGuire also, we just, because the district court uh, decided it based on the non-delegable duty exception, which was presented to this court and it presupposed that the, uh, the worker, Mr. Drummond in that case, was not within the course and scope of his employment. I mean, so to a certain extent, the, I mean, the court just made a declarative statement in McGuire that he was not because that's the way the district court decided it and, and it came up in that fashion. I mean, to a certain extent, isn't McGuire just an apposite because that, that question was just assumed rather than decided. That's exactly what I just said. The, the court in McGuire didn't even really consider that application of the restatement. It, it was, as you say, it was assumed and not examined. Mm -hmm. So in, th in that case, I, McGuire is, uh, one of the things that we asked the court to do is, is re-examine McGuire in that lens and take uh, this case through that lens as well. But so Mr. Count Bechtel, isn't that Sorry. contrary to what you just said to me? Because that aspect of McGuire focused on a non-delegable duty theory of vicarious liability not a respondeat superior theory limited to the course and scope of employment. So how do you jive what you just said to Justice Shea with what you told me? What I'm, what I'm asking the, the court to do is, is to first look at the, the, the big picture, which is, which is uh, I, I should say, the specific question that Justice Shea asked had to do with how, how McGuire how this court looked at McGuire. And McGuire didn't, uh, in McGuire, it, it wasn't a consideration of, of section 214, it was just an assumption. What, what I'm asking the court to do is, is, to, is to look at McGuire and decide not, not that, it, uh, actually, what I'm asking the court to do is to put McGuire aside and look at the, at the, the questions here of what determines course and scope. And uh, to get to the argument, uh, and I apologize to jump ahead, but what we asked the court to do is to look at the factors that determine whether something is in the course and scope and look at this court's rulings in, in Keller and Kornick and in Brendan and look at those factors and determine under those factors that it's, it's actually is fully within the course and scope of the employment. Counsel, I, I think, and I'm looking at um, a statement in McGuire from the court um, which squarely addresses the issue in this case, which is when an intentional tort is committed only because of or by virtue of the employment situation, which is essentially what is happening here. I mean, it's, that's your argument is that uh, the employment situation created the imbalance um, uh, and it arose within that employment situation. So, I mean, I think McGuire addressed your argument uh, right on. And I mean, don't we have to overrule McGuire rather than if we were to accept your argument? I, I think that McGuire has been implicitly overruled and I would ask the court to explicitly overrule it because I think that what modern, I think that uh, modern scholarship about the sexual assaults takes into account that it is not about self-gratification. It's more about uh, its exertion of power and, and domination. Can you elaborate more on that? Because I think there is a distinction that the, the government is making between an assault, uh, you know, excessive use of force versus sexual assault. And I think that's an important. It's, it's an interesting feature that of uh, when a, a law enforcement officer uh, beats someone senseless with a club and or shoots them and or tases them they're liable for excessive use of force because that's an expected part of policing. And I think the argument that the amici have made convincingly is that another expected part of policing is sexual force. It's an accepted part. I mean, uh, it's not in their job description, obviously, but it's used quite commonly to dominate uh, people who, who are being policed. And for that reason, Your Honor, it, here is a situation where, uh, you know, Officer Bullcoming you know, he never hinted, said, testified or anything else. He said, the reason I'm raping you is because of uh, sexual gratification. 
the when Judge uh, Kavan and Judge Waters determined that they had no basis for it. There was nothing in the fact and in current scholarship uh, over over the issue of sexual assaults is pretty clear that sexual assault is an act of violence committed to assert power and control over a victim. As we look at the, the Department of Justice, the federal government's attorney in their in their uh, bulletin, the art of interrogating rapists said just that sexual assault is an act of violence committed to assert power and control over a victim, not for sexual gratification. So the power and control underlies excessive use of force as well as sexual assault. Exactly. There's a, when a when a cop is beating someone senseless, you know, it's same idea. It's to exert domination. Now, as I said, for 30 years, Mr. Bechtel, you, you said in your response there earlier that you thought that McGuire, at least the portion of it that's problematic here for you, had been implicitly overruled by us in what case? And how, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I think through uh, the application of Section 214 in Paul, Your Honor, just because you could, uh, what, what Paul allowed with the adoption of Section 214, it allowed the court to sidestep those questions. So what, what you have a situation is when, for example, the federal court in, in Shepard v. Amtrak and again in Ripley, Smith v. Ripley, when it considered the, the juxtaposition of a case where there is a rape and a question of course and scope, what the federal court in both those decisions said, look, the Montana Supreme Court has said that rape is not in the course and scope of employment relying on McGuire and then said, but well, that doesn't matter because we can use section 214 to assign liability to, this, to the actor. So by what I mean is that's the way the sidestep around it is the, is the implicit overruling. And so what I'd like the court to do is to find, uh, is to make a, a clear statement that McGuire is no longer the law. And so that when Judge Christensen or Judge Morris sees that situation in federal court, they, they no longer will say, McGuire is the law and under McGuire, sexual assault can never be in the course of scope. Because I think that if you look at the factors in that this court has described in Brendan, that if, if you look through it, it's, I think it's clear that in, in the case of a police officer, the, the, the sexual assault is completely expected in, in the way that they police. The, the, the Brendan factors, if you look at them, you know whether the act was commonly done it's, I think, from the, the amica, you make it pretty clear that the, the sexual assault by police officers is common. So and the, what you're talking about, I mean, there's a difference between, I, I think you're sort of conflating the 214 restatement and the non-delegable duty with what you're now talking about is 229, section 229, and the course and scope factors. And that's really what your argument is focused on. I mean, that's what this case is focused on, is those factors under restatement section 229, and not the whole non-delegable duty issue, isn't it? You're absolutely correct, Your Honor. That's exactly what it's about. And, and if we look at those factors, we can see that particularly for BIA officers, it, it, uh, sexual assaults are not out of the, are not out of the ordinary. Every five days on average, a police officer is re reported for sexual misconduct. And the rate of sexual assaults by police officers is more than twice the rate of the general public. And if we look at the time, the place and purpose of the act, uh, section 229 uh, comment B, it's pretty clear that if you, if, even if the, the employer didn't authorize atrocious conduct, the employee disregarded the employer's instruction but it doesn't necessarily preclude the finding that he was acting in furtherance of the employer's interests. And so this comes back to what is the purpose of, of, of dominating the public in policing? So- Well, Mr. Bechtel, I, I think that's your strongest argument here to try to fit these facts into Restatement 229, Comment B. Uh, and we did lay those out in Brendan. And I guess I want to ask you about that is that you made the point here earlier that, well, this is a common or at least not unfortunately common, certainly not in frequent occurrence, this being uh, sexual assault by a police officer, particularly in relation to Native American women. But is that really what 
you uh, think that the criteria in uh, Restatement 229 Comment D refers to when it talks about uh, foreseeable conduct, conduct that is foreseeable by the employer, even though not authorized, in relation to the performance of the duty, or is it more just of coincidental criminal conduct? How do you distinguish the two in application here? You know, the, the power and authority that comes with being law enforcement, it, it's that power and authority that allows law enforcement to, you know, to you know, uh, kneel on someone's neck until they die. It's, it's kneeling on someone's neck until they die is not in the job description. But it, it's the it's the opportunity that 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 being a law enforcement officer provides that allows that to happen. So it's a sort of thing as is uh, in the Restatement Third Seven Hundred Seven, where it said it it's it rises out of it's incidental to it come, but for that opportunity, it would never have the opportunity to occur. But couldn't that then be more broadly applied to any situation where there's a power imbalance that results in tortious, in this case, criminal conduct committed by the employee who against a third party victim who's on the downside of the power imbalance. How do we, doesn't that expansively open up liability here uh, well, way beyond where the state of the law sits at the moment? No, I, I don't think it does, Your Honor, because the what where the state of the law sits now is, is that whenever whenever some, well, I guess what we're asking to do, the state of the law that we're asking the, the court to look at is specific to sexual assaults. And, and because the, 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 the facts surrounding sexual assaults are so horrendous, it, it doesn't come up that often. And it certainly not, it doesn't come up as often as the counties and, and the league uh, state in, in, their, you know, their, in their brief that the sky is falling. It, it's not. The purpose, uh, of, of, of making the employer liable is simply to, is to reduce tortious conduct. It's when, and ever since the, uh, the, in the state, as soon as, as soon as Paul Plass, uh, in, as soon as Paul became law, you know, it's resulted in better hiring practice, better supervision practices, and, and frankly, better safety for all citizens except on the reservation because they're not policed by state officers. Council is, it seems to me, though, that part of what you're talking about, particularly if we're go going to continue to apply the restatement and the foreseeability aspects of it, is at the end of the day, I mean, this was presented to the federal district court on cross motions for summary judgment. It seems to me like a lot of the argument here is, I mean, there are facts that have to be fleshed out, which it wouldn't be, which would I mean it wouldn't be appropriate for summary judgment to either side. You no, know, Your Honor, I, I don't think that's true. The what. In the, in the federal tort claim that the judge is the fact finder. And the judge here, uh, Judge Kavanaugh has already determined as a, in his factual finding that, that as a matter of fact, that the LB, uh, when Officer Bull Cumming raped LB, there was, it was no way that could uh, benefit the BIA. But that was within the context of findings and recommendations for summary judgment and whether it should be granted to the plaintiff or the defendant. What I'm talking about is, I mean, that's, presupposing undisputed facts. And in this instance, isn't this something when you're talking about particularly sexual assault and whether it's being used commonly and certainly whether it's foreseeable under the, the criteria of the restatement, I mean, those seem to be things you're talking about, it's commonality. Isn't that inherently a fact issue that is not susceptible to summary disposition? You know, that was the, the court's holding in Brendan, that when you have a mixed motive situation like this, a, a factual finding would be more appropriate. But I, I think what the, the, the situation here is, but when you're dealing with a rape, it's very important that the judges, whatever judge is considering it, not, try not to get in the head of a rapist and try to figure out how it happened or why it happened. And what was the factual record at summary judgment? What was the basis for, the, for that factual determination? That was uh, Judge Kevin's determination based on his own opinion. There was no record of anything about any, there was no record before the court why the rape was committed. But doesn't that go back then to my question? If there's no record developed, how can there be undisputed facts that just axiomatically decide that it was not within the course and scope or on the flip side, that it was within the course and scope? 
see, I guess what the, the reason that this, that the, a situation like this can never be subject to uh, a factual inquiry of that nature is simply because of the, of the inherent nature of sexual assaults and trying to figure out why it happened. So the, the, does the police officer say, you know, I did it, uh, I did it because, uh, you know, I, I wanted to have sex. But this isn't a situation where a police officer broke into someone's house and, and you know, raped them on, you know, as a, as a crime uh, without being a police officer. This is a situation where he was a police officer using his office as a, as a policeman to negotiate essentially a rape in return for not being arrested. And so what we're asking the court to do is in it, in to avoid making that factual determination and decide as per se, as a matter of law, when a police officer uses the power of his position to coerce a rape or to commit a rape, that the employer is liable and not get into that factual, not to get into that factual quagmire and make a determination as a point of law. Without considering the status of indigenous women and the Native American population, this is an across the board declaration that you want to make, want the court to make. I, I think that, uh, yes, I think, I think it's, it's a point that should be made under a point of Montana law that whenever a police officer uses the power of his position to sexually assault someone that under Montana law, his employer should be liable. So let but, me ask you on that note, <clears throat> since it comes down to state law, how do we deal with the, the fact that our state law 29305 subsection 6B makes state and local governments not liable for criminal actions of their agents. Except to the extent to, to, that at, interacts with the non delegable duty doctrine, Your Honor. So it doesn't answer the course and scope question. No, I, I don't think it does. I think the, 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 the different question here is when you, when, whenever the, the, the state law about liability for uh, empl uh, state employees deals, uh, obviously it's meant to deal primarily with negligent acts. And then in the way that the, the, way the, that the, the courts have interpreted that for the application of section 214 is to, is to add that liability to the, to the state actor for those common carriers and state actors where uh, section 214 applies. So, as I said, it's sort of a, a, a workaround that the court has developed since McGuire and Paul to, uh, to allow liability for those tortious acts, those intentional tortious acts. And uh, I see I'd like to reserve some time for a rebuttal, so I will uh, uh, hold my time until then. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Tarkin, welcome to the Montana Supreme Court. Thank you, Your Honor. Tim Tarka of the District of Montana on behalf of the United States. I um, intend to share about 10 minutes of my time with the, uh, the League of Cities and Counties and the Montana Association of Counties, and I'll keep track of my time. <clears throat> the, the reason I want to begin with the certified question, the reason why the United States proposed an, an alternative to the, the question presented in this court whether it is the phrasing that we use or, or the phrasing that the uh, appellants use at, at page five of their reply brief is to make sure that the question that this court answers reflects the United States Supreme Court's holding in United States versus Olson um, that the scope of the United States waiver of sovereign immunity under the Federal Tort Claims Act depends on <clears throat> Uh, state law liability with respect to private entities, not uniquely governmental liability. And the Ninth Circuit applying that law in this, in, in this very context, in a case called Zulu versus Powell, um, determined that uh, uh, whether the existence or absence of it, an exception or, or unique liability on for with respect to state law enforcement officers is not the right question for addressing the Federal Tort Claims Act um, and instead looked at the law 
law as it opposed as it applies to private entities <clears throat> and reject you know so rejected the application of the Mary M case in Cal California which uh, appellants rely on in their in their opening brief here and appellants on in their reply really don't dispute that the question is uh, uh, one that must relate to private actors in order to fall under the 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 um, the application for the Federal Tort Claims Act. They do propose rephrasing the question as we uh, as, as we presented it. The United States has no problem with appellant's phrasing or any other phrasing that this, this court might choose with respect to the question, so long as the answer addresses state uh, liability as it applies to private actors. So counsel, can you address then the argument that a Native American victim is treated differently based on whether she's raped by someone who uh, is employed by the state versus the United States. We absolutely believe that there is no dichotomy um, with respect to that issue. Um, the the, the uh, appellants assert that there would that there would be different law with respect to um, in, in this case with respect to whether or not this was a, a state situation or a private system uh, or, or the federal situation, but even, and I, and I will let, I know Amiki uh, address that significantly, the application of Paul, and I'll leave that to, to her to discuss, but even if you took the assumption that, that, two for, uh, that 214, uh, the non-deliable duty applied um, in, in general, appellants make no, no it's it's just a bare assertion. There's no citation or um, or application to why it would apply in this case, given that the very premise of the non-delegable duty doctrine is that there's a pre-existing duty um, with respect to between the employer between the employer and the third party. Um, there's no law that they cite or or that I'm aware of that applies that in the context of that, that the employee's own wrongdoing can create that pre-existing relationship. I, I think that they have um, implied the trust, implicated the trust obligations for the uh, tribes. There, there isn't any, uh, respectfully, there, is, well, there isn't any law on that point at all. They can't point to any, any case with respect to that. And even if that were true, that wouldn't be a situation with, with the, it wouldn't be an issue with respect to dichotomy because a state actor in, in a, a state law enforcement officer would not be in the same situation. So that, that wouldn't, that sort of, that doesn't jive with their, um, with, with their argument with respect to there being a dichotomy here. But importantly, even though we've spent a lot of time discussing the, the non-delegable duty doctrine, appellants concede that Section 214, the non-delegable duty doctrine is not a source of liability under the Federal Tort Claims Act. They do that at pages two and pages 20 of their, their brief here, uh, and, and, and they conceded it at the appellate court as well. The non-delegable duty, the, the question of the Federal Tort Claims Act is scope of employment. Um, and the non-delegable duty doctrine uh, applies outside of, and, this is how the, the that, that law was applied in McGuire. And I, and I do want to address Ju Justice Shea's question. <clears throat> the McGuire court expressly did go through the analysis to determine whether um, the orderly's actions in, in McGuire were within the course and scope of employment. The, the court, articulated the rule from Kornick and articulated the rule from section 228 um, and explained as this court has many times before and since that the employee's actions must be in furtherance of or for the benefit of the employer and then found the McGuire situation to be a case in which the employee's actions clearly were not for the benefit of the employer. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, the, the same argument could have been made in McGuire. I don't know that it was that uh, sexual assault of institutionalized, developmentally disabled 
wards of the state uh, could be foreseeably assaulted by orderlies or whoever the attendants were. But now at this point in time, as pointed out uh, today and in the briefing, there is significant data that it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's certainly not uncommon to have abuse of power by law enforcement officers resulting in sexual assault of people incident to performance of law enforcement function, particularly, but not exclusively in the uh, female Native American population. So in regard to the point that they're trying to make here that this is a reasonably foreseeable incident of law enforcement work, how do you dispute that? So let me, let me answer that question in two ways. First, getting to, to the, the facts and what we know uh, uh, about this case and the, and, the, and the holding below, and then more broadly to, to the question, um, to, to the question as how the law applies generally. I, contrary to what we, has been said here today, that we, there are undisputed facts in the record as to what Mr. Bull Cummings' motivation was in this particular case. I would recommend the court's attentions to pages nine and 10 of the, uh, of the supplemental excerpts of record included in the appendix, which uh, uh, are the undisputed facts that Mr. Bull Cummings' actions arose out of a pre-existing quote, crush uh, on the victim, the, the but exchange. I mean, but still, right? He's in his uniform. He's the, uh, whether she thinks he's got a crush on her or not, right? How does someone like LB protect herself when law enforcement wearing their uniform shows up, tells the person that they're there under the authority of the law, and then misuses that authority to abuse that person? H how does, what, what are you suggesting the protections for that person are? The, the protections for that person are that that is a, is a serious criminal offense that, that, and in this case, Mr. Bull Cummings was investigated, prosecuted, and convicted of that offense. Um, and that is, that is primarily the protections that we have with respect to, to sexual violence. Um, this would be a different case, and this goes back to, to Justice Sandifer's question as well. You can't, what, what the appellants really want to do here is import the, the type of claims that, that go around improper hiring, improper training, improper supervision, um, and, and import those without pleading and proving those things into, into some sort of general scope of, of employment and just sort of assert it as a fact. Well, don't you think that this type of employment is unique? No, uh, again, two answers to your question, Your Honor. No, I, I don't think it's, it's unique. You don't they have get... incredible power over people that they investigate and arrest. A abs absolutely, Your Honor. There, there's no question there is a power imbalance, but a, the power imbalance doesn't get any, any more different, a, a greater differential than, than the hospital orderly and the entire- Well, and, they're asking us to overrule McGuire. And I agree that the McGuire incident is, is equally horrific. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It, um, but what they're, what they're asking you to do if you overrule McGuire is to change Montana law to say, uh, again, Montana law, which has been consistent with the restatements all the way through this court's opinion in Brendan, a, a question of whether the employee's actions are to the benefit of or for the furtherance <laughs> of uh, the employer's interests. And stepping outside of that would mean this court abandons the restatements uh, 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 applies that law even in the context beyond what California did in Mary M, which has been has been very limited. Well, let's go back to that then, to the point that you were trying to make. 
in regard to Brendan and its discussion and application of the restatement about the, the, that in this particular case, the facts are in part anyway, that this police officer had some personal sexual interest in this victim. That's also that's the case, but it's also an undisputed fact in this case that he's in her home uh, in an official capacity investigating a DUI call. Essentially, he finds her uh, in, in an apparent state where she's at least been using alcohol and tells her that we're going to have to do something about this. Now, th that could mean that uh, as she perceived it, that he wants to try to leverage this to have sex with her, uh, and or it could mean also, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, that he needs to do something in his capacity to enforce the law because he's there, there's some indication that his report of her being intoxicated is, is accurate. So doesn't that, or how does that not fall perhaps uh, ambiguously factually into this mixed motive uh, scenario that we found uh, present in Brendan and at least raises a question of fact as to whether or not this criminal conduct could be within the course and scope of employment. Um, a couple answers to that, Your Honor. The first is we disagree that Mr. Bullcoming ever had any business in, in uh, the victim's home in this case that he, he had investigated the, uh, the DUI situation and there's no indication that there was any law enforcement purpose for him to, to go to her home in the first place. Um, and furthermore, with respect to that point, factually, the fact, the fact that this comes after she had said, um, uh, okay, if you gotta take me in, take me in, that's my, my consequence. And that's again, at supplemental excerpts of the record, page eight. Um, that that he declined to do to to do his job um, if 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 we can if we can see that far he declined to do his job and instead acted solely on for his own sexual interests. Um, so and, and the other point that I, I want to make on that is but, but there's no factual basis in the facts that are stipulated or presented to us in the question that he went there for any purpose other than initially in furtherance of his law enforcement duties. Isn't that correct? I, I, wanna, I wanna address that, Your Honor. There isn't anything in, in the, the facts, as the agreed upon facts that were pre presented to this court, but what I wanna make absolutely clear is the, the agreed upon facts that are presented to this court come from the issues that were raised below and appellants have never challenged throughout this, this uh, litigation a cl the claim that Mr. Bullcoming's motivations himself were not, um, were, were other, challenged the magistrate's findings that there was no question of fact as to Mr. Bullcoming's motivation. I think you're right about that, but that doesn't necessarily exclude a mixed motive here. On this fact pattern that I can see, it, do you disagree with that? I, 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 I do disagree. I, I think that the appellants had a burden if they, wanted, if they wanted, wanted to challenge the, the Mr. Bullcoming's motivations, they had, they had a burden of presenting, um, pr presenting facts to support their claim that there was anything else here. Well, the with, facts are there in, in, in what's been stipulated to us and, and, and the inferences that can be made thereon, are they not? No, no, Your Honor. Um, About that he's there for a law enforcement purpose, at least in part. Again, those facts weren't developed because that challenge, because that argument had, 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 had never been made. Let me, let me, let me go back to some, a basic question. Does, uh, back to the, Federal Tort Claims Act. Is there a waiver of liability for uh, 
federal officers who use excessive force in the course of scope of their duties. Yes, Your Honor. So a person uh, who alleges that an officer uh, exceeded his uh, duties by using excessive force uh, in, 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 imposes a liability on his federal employer. Yeah, well, the yes, Your Honor, the test is is exactly the same. The test is, is the employee asking, of course, in scope, but is the employee acting uh, it, it, with conduct arising out of and in furtherance of um, the the his his work for the employer, and in so so if you go back so test? if you go back let me let me just finish it so if you go back to uh, the discussion we're having here as Gustus, uh, Justice Justice Gustafson said uh, he's wearing his uniform he's uh, responded with the police vehicle uh presumably he's uh has a weapon and all the attachments that you would have because he is on duty no question about that uh, so what we what this boils down to is the same question you would have under the excessive use of force because arguably that's what this is uh there'd still be liability well if you argue acting in the course of scope if if the actions are in furtherance of and for for the benefit of the employer and so here i, I want to turn back to brendan and i think it also addresses judge justice sandifer's question which is what the court explained in brendan based on that restatement 22 the the court court in full the the restatement passage that said now a simple assault arising out of something like a debt collection <clears throat> could be in the course and scope of employment, but it would not be if that action is done with such violence that it is no longer, <clears throat> um, no longer bears a, is different in kind from the, the simple uh, kind of aggression that would be implied, uh, would, would be necessary. And the court said, or the restatement says the, a similar thing in section 231 dealing with serious crimes says that an employer might be able to to predict something like bribery or um or malicious statements would 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 follow from in dealings with a competitor but if the employee shoots a competitor even at, out of uh interest in in serving the the employer out of zeal for the master it is still outside the course and scope of, of employment because it is too outrageous um, a manner, e even if the goal, and this goes to Judge Sandifer's question, even if we, we look past the waiver and look past the facts and believe that um, Mr. Bullcoming acted under some sort of perverse intent to serve the master by, by using sexual violence, um, it, it, that is exactly what the restatement has said and what this court has said is outside of the bounds of the kind of behavior that would be in the court. So let me ask you a hypothetical then. <clears throat> Let's say that he did decide to, her, to arrest her. And as he was patting her down, he ran his hands all over her body as he was handcuffing her. What then? That would, that would absolutely be a, a, a different situation and, and likely one that we, you would need to that would be a question of fact. That what, what makes this so extreme is there is absolutely never any reason to rape anybody. Is there and a reason to fondle a person's breasts? There, there, well, there is, there is a reason to pat a person down. And, and it, it's like, it's like that, that is like but the excessive use what? of the hypothetical no. was right and so as long as he doesn't arrest her and assaults her it's okay but if he arrests her and assaults her then we get some liability no your honor um i want to be uh, i want to be clear the um what 
it is, there is a, a, a area around the activities, like the situation in with in the three statement talks about with a debt collector. There is an area around that where you're, you're still, at least in part, serving the employer's interest, either with an arrest or with a pat down for weapons, even if that it exceeds that into, into criminal behavior to a certain extent. But it is absolutely, but rape is absolutely outrageous. There is no reason to, uh, to do that and no reason this court has to recognize that that kind of serious criminal behavior is anywhere close to, but, uh, to, to behavior. I do want, I, I, I want to answer your question and then I want to let. Uh, I, I guess counsel that doesn't reflect the developments in society that have been brought out um, by uh, the victim respecting uh, the abuse of power and that relationship and, and, and the, the developments and the need to, uh, to hold that excessive um, use of force, that, that poor judgment um, in the scope of duty to hold the government accountable. I, I, I disagree, Your Honor. I, I believe there is there's still never any reason to that that this kind of uh, of activity is anywhere near the, the course and scope, even if he believed. But it's about the power imbalance. It's about the, it, the police when they had George Floyd on the ground and were abusing their their power. The same imbalance occurs here. And the, and the second uh, uh, question I have is why isn't that something that should be submitted to a trier of fact? Um, the 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 answer to the question with respect to to the the, the trier fact is is the the for to do that the court would have to to change its law and find that the that the um the, that the employee is is acting outside of the course and scope despite uh, despite it it not being incidental to or not being motivated by the employer and I really do want to give the uh, uh, Yamiki some time. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Thanks. Corey. Thank you, Counsel. May it please the court. My name is Natasha Jones. I'm from Boone Carlberg, and it's my privilege to stand before you as a friend of the court today on behalf of the Montana League of Cities and Towns and the Montana Association of Counties, whose members in our state employ the majority of the sworn law enforcement officers that serve our cities, towns, and communities, serve and protect them. Uh, I have a limited amount of time, so I wanna, I wanna jump right in to address some of the questions that's been raised. First, Justice McKinnon, to your question, there already exists right now a method of direct liability against a department to the extent they are negligent in the hiring, training, or supervision of their officers. So to the extent there needs to be reform in the policies and practices of the, of the departments, that already exists in the law. What, what is being forwarded here is that if, if, if a department is doing everything right, following the or, already burdensome hiring process and training process and supervision processes, still a criminal can work his way into a system because criminals look for opportunities and they can engage in intentional, violent criminal conduct. This is not unique to law enforcement. Counsel, do we know from the record that the BIA in this case of the government did everything right in hiring Mr. Bullcoming? What we know is that there is no allegations of any negligence on the part of the agency uh, that have been made and presented to this court as of record about the hiring, training, and supervision of the officer. Those but it's not allegations present here, but it's pre presented to us as a certified question. And if it's, I mean, we can reformulate the certified question, however we want. I mean, it, it, the question seems to be asking for a declaration, yes or no. I mean, <laughs> can it be fact dependent? It can't. And here's why. Um, because you have to set direct liability aside. The, the question here, here is vicarious liability for an intentional violent criminal act. But if the department is aware, I mean, let's let's just say this is a, I mean, if, if they're aware that they've got a sexual predator, and I'm not saying they do or they don't, yep. because we don't have a factual record. 
if they hire a sexual predator, whether there was negligence at the inception of the hiring and training and what have you, but they're aware of conduct that would alert them and they put him out on the streets. I mean, isn't that something that could constitute some liability in, in if the record is developed in such that, I mean, he's, you're giving him the motive means an opportunity or certainly the means an opportunity to commit this crime. And that path already exists in the law and requires nothing for you from you. What is being asked of you is to change the law to create a strict liability, vicarious liability for an innocent agency when their officer engages in intentional criminal conduct. That is the question before you. And again, that's what I'm saying. That goes to my point about reformulating the certified question, that there could be circumstances where depending on the foreseeability or the knowledge of the department and they continue to put somebody out there on the streets that that could be construed as being within the course and scope of their duty if they're putting somebody out there who is a sexual predator like Mr. Bullcoming was. Yeah, so I'm gonna quarrel with you a bit on the, on the last statement that you made, right? So if you have knowledge that, that there's a pattern in practice, yes, but rape is never an expected authorized use of force, never. Never. And, and that's what's being asked, asked here is, is that because it can happen, then what we must do as agencies and communities is ensure that behavior because they, are, they do not believe the remedy is adequate. That is a legislative consideration, not for this court based on these facts. This power imbalance, it exists everywhere. It is the path to which a criminal obtains access to his victims. And it happens for teachers, for clergy, for coaches, for Boy Scout leaders, for judges and politicians. This power differential exists everywhere. And criminals can hide their inner intentions in order to provide access for themselves to victims. What that means is, is that you can be doing everything right in the training, in the screening, in the hiring, in the supervision. And criminals can find their way because they are looking for access. So to your question, what puts you in, in the home is a pretext. That is a pretext. It is the same argument that has been made for Boy Scout leaders and teachers. And to, and to say that in the absence of any notice that we should be strictly liable, the community, should be strict, strictly liable when an officer crosses the line from law-abiding officer sworn to protect and serve to criminal, that we should ensure and pay for that behavior. But that's, I don't think, and I'm certainly not suggesting that in the absence of notice, I'm talking about why shouldn't there be a liability when there is notice? That path already exists in the law and requires no certified question from the Ninth Circuit. So isn't that something that then the, the answer to the question is, potentially rather than a yes or a no. I, I don't because agree. we don't know whether we don't know what Mr. Bull Cummings history was. I disagree with that because rape is never within the course and scope. And it, if I may yes, I'll just please. just finish this. Rape rape never arises out of or is committed in, in the prosecution of law enforcement duties. It never serves the interest Rape, Justice Sanford, rape never has a mixed or dual motive. Never. I, I didn't suggest that it did. <laughs> these, I, these I, I the... said what his motive was in being there and then what facilitated this. That's the question of fact that I was pressing. And I would direct your attention to the restatement third of agency 7.07. .07. This was discussed in the Brendan case. And in that, in, in that comment, it is made clear that there is a line beyond which you cross when you cannot be found in the course of scope, it's course and scope of employment, because it's neither fair nor true to life to characterize the employee's actions as that of, as representative of the employer. So and rape crosses the line clearly. And so the answer to the certified question should be no, definitively no. So the remedy would be against the government for negligent hiring because perhaps there had been a history of a sexual offense is committed by Bull Cumming. And if you want, and if you're concerned about the lack of a remedy outside of that, that is a legislative question. 
Uh, we, recently, the, our legislator passed House Bill 92. That created a system of compensation for uh, individuals who had been uh, uh, convicted of felony crimes and imprisoned and then later exonerated. Our legislators determined that there needed to be a remedy in that scenario and they passed a law. And here, we are asking that you follow the wisdom of McGuire because the policy considerations, if you open this door, are significant and real. They will okay. harm our communities and they will harm the provision of law enforcement's essential duties to serve and protect in their communities. That is a uniquely legislative endeavor. And, okay, and the idea made that- You've made your point. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your time. Mr. Brechtel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as, as both the, the, the counties and the government have, have claimed that uh, there's never a reason to rape anyone. And I think that let the scholarship has clearly showed that there's often reasons to rape people. In fact, the Department of Justice's own experts say that the reason to rape is to, is to assert power. That's why there's rape going on. That, that, that's, where, that's the reason to rape. So here, uh, the, the, the hope for a legislative remedy is uh, this is something that the, you know, LB has been waiting six years for a legislative remedy from the federal government and she's not gonna get it. There is no negligent hiring in the federal system. That's, that's not a claim. So where are we gonna go? What the Ninth Circuit's found was a dichotomy. We didn't, we didn't find the dichotomy, the Ninth Circuit did. They said, that's not, this is not just our argument. The Ninth Circuit has expressly addressed the question about this question about law enforcement. They said, look, there is a gap. Here's your chance to fix it. Now, the, the question is formulated by the, not certain, by the Ninth Circuit. It's not subject to a factual inquiry. You, certainly this court can reformulate the question, but the question itself is not subject to a factual inquiry. So the, the power imbalance exists everywhere, but, only people who are policed by federal law enforcement are subject to the gap. The counties talk about all these things that are very dangerous things that happen to our communities, but there's every community in Montana, except those policed by federal law enforcement officers already have a remedy. The court has given them a remedy under 214. The people who don't have a remedy, as the Ninth Circuit pointed out, are those people who are policed primarily by federal officers. So that's what the court is, what the Ninth Circuit is asking to address. What happens then? There is no legislative fix. It's not going to come from the federal government because it's a question of state law, whether it's, this act is in the course and scope. And that's why the Ninth Circuit is saying, look what we have here. There's a situation, Montana, I don't think you like it. How are you gonna fix it? And that's what the, the, the certified question does. So, the whole notion of whether uh, the the how the the uh, the government has suggested to re to reformulate the certified question is uh, to talk about employees of private employers who misuse their authority. Uh, if that is the way you formulate the question, uh, it wouldn't be it it just be inapplicable here because obviously uh, Mr. Bull Cumming wasn't an employee of a private employer. So you, you would concede that, the, that there's nothing that uh, this officer did that was to the benefit of his employer? No, I would not. I would absolutely not concede that because the, the whole reason, as, as the Department of Justice said, part and parcel of, of rape is asserting power and control. That's, that's part of what he was doing. That's part of why the BIA has so many problems with that is because it's part of the, the it's part and parcel of their culture of policing. So yes, it absolutely has part of it's part of the what they're doing. No question about it. Just trying to see if you had gone away. But council, and this is the flip side of what I was asking uh, Ms. Jones is what I mean. What if the department does everything right? I mean, I see your distinction, but it seems to me like you're both swinging for the fences here. And I think that 
there is a factual determination that is inherent in this because you can have a department that is aware that, and we don't know what the department is here with the Northern Cheyenne tribe, but you can have a department that is aware that officers are using whatever methods, however heinous, to enforce, and that could be construed as advancing the interests of the department because we're keeping the population under control or whatever. You could also have a situation where the department does everything right and somebody sneaks into the department. And it seems to me like that is inherently a fact issue to determine as opposed to a declarative yes or no under all circumstances. Your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on his answer, I'm gonna ask for more time too. <laughs> Good night. I didn't even talk the most this time. <laughs> Uh, Justice Shea, the, uh, the public policy considerations for making the department liable for the actions of its employees has been, I mean, well described in tort law. I mean, the, what you have here is an, an unequal and inadequate legal protections and remedies for Native Americans in Montana. And that's, that's really what it comes right down to is because they are policed by federal employees, federal officers. They don't have the same remedy that, that everyone else does, that non-Natives do that most non-natives do. So the, the thing here is we can't fix the FTCA. We, you, know, you don't have any ability to change what the Federal Tort Claim Act, but you, do you can fix how it's applied in Montana. And here's a chance for Montana to, to affect how federal law is applied in our state and, and to hold the federal government accountable for putting the officers it does on the street. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So when the, when the Ninth Circuit says, you know, here is the question that we want you to answer, they've formulated what they describe. It's, it's clear to me that, that they think that there is uh, a, a use of his authority to rape someone in the way they formulated their question. So it, it goes without saying that, well, what happens next? If they use the authority of, of, their, of their law enforcement position to, to sexually assault someone, why not hold the federal government liable because they're the federal government is the one who put them on the street. Thank you. Thank you all. Council. This concludes the uh, argument on this matter. Um, and I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, students at the University of Montana, particularly the law review for helping put this on and providing an introduction. Uh, I want to thank the law school for giving us free parking. <laughs> free opportunity we hope. Here, that we hope. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and thank you all for attending. We will uh, take this matter under advisement and issue an opinion in due course. So some refreshments over at the law school room 201 immediately following if anyone's interested uh, the attorneys will be there other parties will be there uh, we are happy to entertain any discussion about the case happening right now at the law school room 201.